Well, golly gee, Jim Bob, there's been an outbreak of umbrage and opprobrium in the comments yesterday following my determination that, broadly, the Nissan e-Power hybrid system is such an appalling piece of crap. I'm John Logan from AutoExpert.com.au, new cars cheap, Australia only, website, card. Now, one thing I've learned in my long and illustrious career as one of Australia's preeminent investigative shitsters is that the owner of a heap of crap doesn't generally appreciate being informed of such, even though worryingly, you know, the comments is not really the same thing as the audience. It's a bizarre feature of the YouTube ecosystem because likes to dislikes are still like nudging 99%. And yet the comments is skewed a little more towards broad audience displeasure it's fair to say. Without wanting to come across as too anal on the subject, as you have obviously put in the time to make the comparison between the gormless would-be EV and the petrol version, what are the curb weights of each version? Isn't the hybrid dragging around a couple of passengers worth of dead weight before anyone gets to drive it, given the addition of a battery, a generator and two electric motors on top of the petrol engine that would manage perfectly happily without the electrical garbage? Obviously just a warm up this one so that we don't go out too hard, too early and suck in too much raw opprobrium and thus get injured and sidelined before things get really interesting. Speaking of which, what's really interesting to me about this one is here we've got a dude, I'm presuming a dude, who is watching a YouTube video and yet somehow incapable of going to a website like nissan.com slash something and just looking up the weight of Duos model variants. Like, serious need to be spoon-fed, dude. But to answer your question, because I'm all about the service, right? The all-wheel drive e-power X-Trail is 239 kilos heavier than its ICE-only counterpart. That's the TIL variant, TIL all-wheel drive versus e-power all-wheel drive here in Australia. And there might be minor differences in variants around the world, but hey, it's nearly a quarter of a ton for all of that additional hybrid shit. It's a 14% increase in mass, and roughly this is like having a young family on board at all times before anyone actually gets in the vehicle or puts in any of their stuff. And I would suggest that Colin Chapman would be spinning in his frickin' grave that this is a pathway to efficiency because the main way to make cars more fuel efficient is reduce the mass. Not quite that straightforward. Ice engines have different efficiencies under different RPMs and load. There is a sweet spot when the ice engine has a peak efficiency, generally low RPM and higher load. For that reason, it is more efficient to use the highest possible gear for the car's speed and load when you are driving. It takes the same amount of energy to propel your car forward at 60 miles an hour in fifth and fourth gear. However, driving in fourth gear will drain your tank quicker. Why am I telling you this? Because the hybrid propulsion system allows the engine to always be in its most efficient operating mode while the electric motor moves you forward. For that reason, diesel electric locomotives are more efficient. It's not just about regeneration. Diesel electric locomotives being more efficient, like really. Where are we going to find an equivalent contemporary diesel mechanical powertrain locomotive like they don't exist so how can we conclude that diesel electric locomotives are quote more efficient and furthermore if your hypothesis is correct okay that operating the combustion engine in some magical efficient configuration of load and throttle and RPM and all of that stuff is going to derive a miraculous benefit for fuel efficiency, then 
ePower would be a real winner and the evidence for that would be in the official fuel consumption figures because how could it not? If it's that freaking effective to do this, to run the engine like that because it is decoupled from the wheels, then why is this not shown in the actual fuel consumption data, which we'll get to. I've done a couple of comparisons on that with roughly equivalent vehicles, and it's just not there. It just doesn't perform. So I think this is a bit of, you know, Nissan marketing horseshit right near the deadly funnel web spider that I killed the other day, heading for a shoe. Hashtag Australia. Just saying. I'm not seeing this miraculous fuel efficiency reflected in the actual numbers. You're misapplying the second law of thermodynamics. Since the efficiency of a gas engine varies dramatically with RPM and load, it certainly is possible to better gas mileage by running a gas engine at optimum RPM and load. Turn a generator, then use that electrical energy to propel the vehicle. I'm not claiming that the Nissan is more efficient, but it is possible. In fact, that's how diesel electric locomotives work. Anything's possible, dude, but I really don't see how I am misapplying the second law of thermodynamics. It's kind of unlikely in my case because they were fairly definite about how the second law works at university, and they did engage in this horrible weeding out process where if you didn't get on board, you kind of didn't get the magic piece of paper at the end of the six, or in my case, seven years, and that would have been somewhat disappointing. So there's that. Now, conventional powertrain efficiency, like if you've got the crankshaft coming out the anus of a combustion engine and you connect it to a transmission of sorts, like a mechanical transmission, and it ultimately goes through a differential or a transaxle or something of that nature and actually gets motive power to the tyres that are just waiting to go on the road, then broadly, you lose about 15%. So that kind of system is, and it does vary, but 85% efficient, okay? Second law says, every time you do a process, you lose available energy. And this is why you can never have a machine running at 100% efficiency. That's just how this rolls. So you're losing 15% by having a transmission, a prop shaft, a differential, bearings, axles, drag through the brakes, whatever, 15% is getting burned between the anus of the ice and the actual action on the ground. That's broadly accepted across the industry, but there is some variation, and it obviously depends on the operating conditions and the nature of the transmission and all of that shit as well, but 85%, okay? With e-power, you've got the same anus of an ICE engine, but it's driving a generator. And generators are typically about 90% efficient, right? And in this case, out of the anus of the generator, you have to run an inverter because the motor is AC and generators produce DC. So you have to invert it up into AC. And an inverter, like a really good inverter, is going to be sort of 95% efficient. So yay, it's compliant with the second law of thermodynamics also. And then your traction motor, the anus of the inverter will deliver electricity to the traction motor, and the traction motor is a brushless AC motor typically, and that's going to be about 90% efficient in the real world because all of these rotating electrical devices have magnetic induction losses, and there's heat, and there's bearings and mechanical drag and things of that nature, so they can't be 100% efficient either, right? So 90% for a brushless AC motor, let's say. So if you get your 90% for your generator and then you multiply it by 95% for your inverter and then multiply it by 90% for your brushless AC motor, 77% 
versus about 85 for a mechanical driveline. And obviously these are just ballpark estimates and they might go up and down a little bit, but that's kind of where we are. And what I would suggest is that the e-power system, by virtue of its configuration, it is less efficient than a mechanical drive system. And this is purely owing to the number of processes at play to get the motive power from the anus of the ice to the wheels on the deck wanting to turn and burn, or in this case, turn without too much burning, right? There's nothing you can do about that. The second law is like the freaking matrix. It's everywhere. It says every time you do a process, you lose energy. So we're talking about a 10% less efficient system than a conventional transmission, and the rest of it is all just marketing wank, dude. Like, that's how this works. If you go via the battery, right, lithium-ion rebound shot. If you go via the battery, then lithium ion batteries are actually pretty efficient if you recharge them slowly and discharge them slowly. So maybe a couple of percent each way there. Although I'd have to say this is a pretty small battery and it has to work very hard at times to meet the motive power demands that are imposed upon it. And it's designed to do that, but it can't be that efficient when it is discharging quickly. So you'll lose even more than that if the motive power or some of it comes via the battery. Now, as to these people who always tell me about diesel electric locomotives and that's how this works, right? It's not how this works. There's no battery in a conventional diesel electric locomotive. And there's no kinetic energy recovery. Like they do regeneratively brake locomotives, but typically the motors, like the traction motors, turn into generators and they produce electricity in regen mode to try and keep the whole thing at a constant speed when you're going down a gradient. But that electricity goes into a bank of resistors like radiators in the roof and it drives a whole bunch of electric fans to convectively cool it. Like, that's regenerative braking in a locomotive. So everyone who says that this is just like an electric locomotive, diesel electric locomotive, obviously you don't know how diesel electric locomotives work. Pro tip, the motors, the traction motors in diesel electric locomotives are typically DC motors and not AC motors, and they often operate at extreme voltages like 1500 volts DC kind of thing. I would have thought that the all-electric drivetrain would have that advantage that the engine could run at the most efficient RPMs for energy generation rather than at a range of RPMs depending on the desired speed and acceleration, especially where there is stop-start and idling workloads. Please, there is inefficiency inherent in mechanical drive shaft. I'd be interested if there's any data to reflect one way or the other. This was a very common theme, this purported efficiency, this magical ability to run an engine at some miraculous RPM and throttle settings where it consumes almost no fuel while making the motive power that you need to get the car going. Like, really? Is that how this works? Obviously, in a design like this, the designers have more flexibility to tune load and revs and throttle position than they would otherwise in a mechanical transmission. But we're really not seeing the benefit in the real world here. So this benefit must be comparatively small, although it is helping, albeit hindered by the complexity of the transitions of energy involved in the process and the vehicle's ridiculous additional mass. Oh, John, I really like your videos with an apostrophe that doesn't have to be there, and usually I fully agree with your reasoning, but in this case there are some things missing. One thing is the efficiency gain of a hybrid system. I'm not sure about this one, despite the fact that I'm sure that you are missing it, as it might be more PRBS, but maybe you could do some digging to make sure. One of the upsides of detaching the petrol engine from the wheels would be engine efficiency because of maintaining an optimal RPM again. Another efficiency gain would be avoiding stress on the engine while accelerating. So if this really were the case and it was a defining characteristic of this system, meaning it overcame all of the other systematic limitations and gave us miracle to spare at the end, then yay. But when you look at the percentage improvement in fuel economy going from 
combustion-only Nissan to Nissan ePower versus the same thing, like going from combustion-only to hybrid with some other manufacturers, you don't see an additional miraculous improvement in efficiency for that platform with Nissan. Quite the opposite. And we'll get to that. I've got some examples of that to follow, and you're welcome to do your own research and see if I'm just cherry-picking or not. But I assure you, I am not. And I would suggest to you that if you are getting information and just repurposing it like this, cutting and pasting it and going, well, that's a fact, like this, there's a difference between information and knowledge, right? And I'd suggest that this is the main hurdle that AI is having trouble with now because AI is connected to everything and it's got access, therefore, to endless freaking information, It's not the same thing as being able to join the dots and painting a picture and having actual knowledge, right? So what you're doing if you're just parroting some half-true marketing horse shit is you're being sucked in by some very highly skilled marketing communicators who really just want to hijack your consciousness and get you to go, yeah, yeah, that's really fucking smart, when it really isn't that good at all. I'd suggest that's as kind as I can be, incidentally, about how good that system is. It's crap compared with other hybrid systems that have been in play for much longer and use, in some senses, even worse technology like nickel metal hydride batteries. I'm looking at you, Toyota, for example, and I'm no fan of Toyota, right? You do have more freedom with load and RPM and throttle settings and things of that nature with the e-power system. It's not enough to offset the serious limitations of the platform. And dude, I really don't care if you believe me or not. The facts and the evidence are on my side and they don't care if you believe us either. Sorry, John, I have to give you a dislike. I'll agree that the adverts could have been a lot closer to the reality of a vehicle like this, but Regardless of your hair-splitting comparisons, the idea of a vehicle like this or the one Chevrolet made for a few years has a lot of appeal. A car that can run around town for whatever reason people run around town as an EV sounds good to me and eliminates those deadly urban emissions that bother you so much. Urban emissions are deadly, there's no doubt about it, but the most deadly urban emissions come from old trucks, particularly here in Australia, and the regulators do sweet fuck all about it. It is absolutely a disgrace. Modern combustion-only cars are actually pretty clean when you look at the reduction in oxides of nitrogen, the reductions in carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, things of this nature. They're actually ridiculously clean compared with cars from the 70s. The problem with old trucks is that they migrate in Australia, at least to our capital cities. They often are completely bereft of any emissions controls whatsoever, and they belch their toxic shit all over the city and the suburbs where your kids go to preschool, et frickin' cetera. It's disgraceful. I'm all for reducing urban pollution, and EVs are in fact a great way to do that. They're not perfect, but they are a real step up here when it comes to cleaning up urban pollution and also energy security for Australia. I'm not the slightest bit down on them from a philosophical point of view. I just think, you know, turning this stuff into a religion and not really considering the facts doesn't help if you really want to solve the problem. Now, The battery in an X-Trail e-power. Okay, this is a Ryobi 36-volt lithium-ion battery. It's 5 amp hours, so 536s is like uh, 180 watt hours of energy. The battery in a Nissan X-Trail e-power is 2.1 kilowatt hours, which is 11.7 of these. Okay, so when you think about the uh, hedge trimmer, the line trimmer, whatever that you might run with one of these, or a blower. Blowers are probably pretty intense, actually, for these batteries, which is why even this much energy doesn't last all that long when you use one. When you think about that, and then you think about, say, 12 of these in a row connected to a car, how fucking far do you think 12 of these is going to be able to propel 
a two-ton vehicle, like a medium SUV, like an X-Trail, before the 12 of them are completely exhausted. Like, it's a little bit harder than running a blower for 20 minutes, which is the approximate endurance of this battery, running a blower, right? So the potential for this to clean up the urban environment times 12 running a two-ton car is almost zero because you're going to get a few hundred metres down the road and then the combustion engine is going to have to start up and obviously it is Euro 5 emissions compliant, runs on 95, so it's a pretty clean engine but it's still exactly the engine that our last correspondent is so keen to sideline. It doesn't matter how you're getting the power to the wheels. If it's coming from a combustion engine, it is polluting and emitting. The question is how much, right? This is not the same thing as a plug-in hybrid, for example, where you could plug in using baseload power overnight and drive 20 or 30 kilometres to work or something where you might plug in there and drive back and really not it emit any tailpipe emissions in that time. So when you look at a uh, plug-in hybrid, we're talking about a battery that's roughly 10 times bigger than the battery in an e-power. So th they're a completely different animal, in other words, in terms of cost and complexity and uh, drain on resources, but they do give you that real ability to operate in EV only mode, provided you don't demand higher performance than the EV only side of the powertrain can deliver. But as for urban pollution and a countermeasure being a hybrid, it's really just the diminished fuel consumption. It's not the ability in this e power transmission, at least. It's not the ability to drive any significant difference in electric only mode. Why do you hate Great Britain so much? Such rudeness and your understanding of physics is seriously flawed. Petrol engines are very inefficient when powered up to accelerate the car. The e-system keeps the engine running at its most efficient and overall it's more efficient than pure petrol. Find another 200 horsepower SUV that delivers 55 miles per gallon. It's why diesel trains run that way. Shocking <laughs> video. Dude. Calm down, okay? You're in serious danger of popping a frickin' valve and nobody needs this, all right? And enough with the diesel locomotives. My cup friggin' runneth over on that as to the similarities of which there are none. But I would say, in with the clean air, out with the bad. For disambiguation, stuff that is said obviously in jest should not be taken literally. This is how wars start. Mediocre Britain is, it's okay. King Chiller's great, like he's freaking hilarious and he doesn't even have to do anything. All you have to do is put a photograph of that dude up on the wall and I start laughing. He makes me happy. And you can't say that about most people. The Buckingham Palace, dude, such a highlight. So regal, never been inside, seen it from outside the fence. Lovely building. Boris Johnson's hair. National treasure. I do hope that gets preserved after his death. And Ozzy Osbourne, ladies and gentlemen, peak Brit, he should be king. If I ruled the world, I would make him king of Britannistan in a freaking heartbeat. Let's watch the joint just run better, just be more efficient. And he's a freaking rock star, that dude. Plus, you know, you guys historically sending all the convicts here and retaining the aristocracy out there in that gorgeous weather like well done we've got funnel web spiders great white sharks the cone shellfish box jellyfish the stonefish blue ringed octopus cassowary that's the highlight death adder brown snake. If you see a snake in Australia, it's like, it's deadly, dude. If you come here, just one-way ticket, you won't need the return leg. So, Britannistan, awesome, love your work. I was joking yesterday. Find another 200 horsepower SUV that delivers 55 miles per gallon. Well, I only had three seconds to devote to that, and I nearly got there. RAV4 hybrid, 215 horsepower and 50 miles per gallon, 
bonus points for running on 91 octane versus 95 for the e-power shitbox and it's actually 19 percent better on power to weight so the difference in performance is greater than the difference in power indicates because it's a lighter car and the resale of the toyota won't be shit so there's that uh, i hope that clears that up uh, at this point let's do the numbers here's what the numbers actually say about e-power hybrid versus other hybrids and i know e-power is a newer kit on the block perhaps there are other efficiencies in version three of this system that might be laid out in future but it's really hard to get over the second law limitations with other magic advantages except in the marketing documentation where that is already a freaking done deal so if you get the x-trail til 7.8 litres per 100 for the combustion one versus 6.1 for the all-wheel drive. This is both all-wheel drive, okay? 7.8 versus 6.1 for the hybrid, the e-power. $4,400 more. This is a 22% improvement in fuel efficiency. So, yay, it's more efficient than the combustion one. It adds 239 kilos, and it's got a tiny little battery, 2.1 kilowatt hours, roughly 12 of these, okay? If I wanted to just have the cheapest shitty shot and make it look bad, but not really have the facts on my side, just do a character assassination, I'd choose the Santa Fe Hybrid as an example, and I'll show you how that plays out, because the V6 versus the V6 petrol, 3.5 litre V6, and the hybrid, 1.6 turbo hybrid, all-wheel drive, okay? 10.5 litres per 100 versus 6, okay? This is a huge improvement. It's only a small battery, 1.5 kilowatt hours, which, I don't know, eight of these, something like that, okay? It's a 43% improvement in fuel efficiency. Like, Jesus. But it's only that good because that's a big, shitty engine that is, frankly, outdated like an Atmo V6, <laughs> throwback from the 80s kind of thing. But it is a 95% better improvement for the platform than the improvement for the platform when you go from combustion to hybrid with the X-Trail, right? It's not very hard to improve the efficiency of that V6 is what I'm saying. So one way you could do that is just get the engine out of the Mazda CX-9 Azami LE or something because... That's a 14% improvement right there. You go from 10.5 to 9 with that vehicle. So we'll put the Santa Fe to one side, but I want you to be aware that an evil bastard could take a cheap shot using a vehicle cherry-picked like that, and I'm not doing that. Here's how this really plays out. Kluger Grande E4 versus the combustion, both in all-wheel drive, okay? Combustion is 8.7 litres per 100, 5.6 for the hybrid, okay? This is $4,580 extra for the hybrid, which is kind of line ball. It's a 36% improvement in fuel efficiency for the Kluger platform versus a 22% improvement for the X-Trail platform. In relative terms, this is a 64% better improvement. I know this is like percentage inception if you didn't pay attention at school, but I would argue on the basis of that data that Toyota's engineers have done a better job with improving the efficiency of the Kluger platform using their hybrid system and it uses a shitty nickel metal hydride battery system, at least it does according to redbook.com.au, and it only adds 35 kilos to the overall mass of the vehicle. This is also a fairly advanced engine in the combustion only one, so it's not a soft target when it comes to improving its fuel efficiency. It's a brand new 2.4 litre turbo four, right? So there's that. And then, even when you look at a notionally shittier brand like 
GWM, the Chinese brand. If you look at the GWM Havel H6 Ultra four-wheel drive, okay, if you look at combustion-only versus hybrid, you go from 8.3 to 5.2, and it only costs you $3,000 more. This is a 37% improvement in fuel efficiency for that platform by virtue of hybridization, and it only adds 60 kilos, okay? Compared with the 22% improvement in efficiency for the X-Trail platform, GWM Havel's engineers have done a 68% better job at engendering greater fuel efficiency in that platform by virtue of using a standard hybrid system, and they're doing it at two-thirds of the price premium extra for the hybrid system. So... You might have bought a Nissan E-Power, Qashqai, X-Trail, whatever, and you might love it. And it might be a luxurious car, and that's all okay with me, dude. But you can't claim with a straight face that the facts are on your side if you say this is so advanced, it's just like a locomotive. There's this miraculous proposition of keeping the engine at its ideal RPM for the load and throttle position and so much more advanced than other hybrids because that is abject horseshit and the facts really do not support that contention. E-Power is a hastily concocted joke and they should just go back to a conventional hybrid system and if they did they could cut roughly 200 kilos out of the mass and the improvement in fuel efficiency would be spectacular.